Good evening, America. My name is Joshua Gilliland, one of the two bloggers for The Legal Geeks. Tonight we're going to talk about a serious issue. Comedy. <laughs> hey, Josh, you look pretty serious there. Jessica, you know, I can't be the straight man when you start laughing like that. <laughs> it's hard not to laugh when you're playing straight man. You know, back in the day, long ago in the 1990s, my family owned a comedy club. No way. Way. And <laughs> I met lots of talented people, had a lot of fun, and learned valuable bartending lessons for law school. Those are valuable lessons. But that's not important right now. Let's talk about the seriousness of being a comedian. Jessica, tell us your experiences with comedy. <laughs> Well, outside of this blog, Josh, um, I am obsessed with stand-up comedians, actually. I love to read about them. I love to watch stand-up comedy. I love to watch documentaries about stand-up comedy. You know, then there's the whole, like, Saturday Night Live angle on it all, too. But I am obsessed with comedy and love stand-up comedians. Um, so that's kind of where tonight's post started, is what happens when stand-up comedians take real-life characters or real-life people from their lives, um, often spouses, you know, relatives, other people, um, and depict them in their shows. Do they have, do these people who are, you know, not able to get up on stage and attack back or respond, do they have any rights? Um, so that's loosely where my idea came from tonight, although, of course, there's a specific show, too, that inspired me as well. Fascinating. So let's say that there is somebody who is a real person that is depicted in a book or a film. What legal rights do they have? And I have a suspicion what the answers are. Okay, well, we'll see if we agree. Um, they can bring claims for defamation is the most common one. Uh, you can also do, you can try to bring claims for invasion of privacy or like a false light kind of invasion. Um, but a lot of, a lot of uh, jurisdictions actually don't recognize those claims. So defamation, of course, the problem is, is you have to show that something was false. The invasion of privacy, you don't need to do that. You just need to say that your privacy, you know, has been invaded. But again, that's why a lot of courts don't like that one because it is such, what, a low kind of burden for the plaintiff to meet. Um, so those are the kind of claims you can bring. The other option is also the commercial misappropriation of your identity kind of claim. That's one, for example, that stars often use. If there was one case where they had a commercial try to use somebody impersonating Bette Midler's voice uh, in, a, in a commercial. Now, it wasn't Bette Midler, but they were obviously trying to rip off kind of her voice and style and make people think it was her. So in that case, she could sue because her identity was obvious and they were misappropriating it. That's tough for somebody who's a real life character who's saying this fictional version of a character on a TV show or in a stand up act or something is them. Um, and in fact, that's where a lot of these plaintiffs have a hard time is that the courts are very reluctant to say that a character in a book, in a t-show, in a movie, in a stand-up routine is actually some real-life person. They want to give a lot of broad leeway to the artist, and so it's very hard for these plaintiffs. They can bring the claims, but it's very hard to actually win kind of claims. So, we need to look at the wings beneath my cause of action. Oh. That was very 1980s. My mother would be proud. So, Let's think about some of the real people out there who've been <laughs> falsely depicted uh, and any examples that you could give. Well, some of the most famous examples, um, for those of us of a certain age now, apparently, who still remember Seinfeld, which is rapidly becoming a classic, um, Seinfeld actually has two prominent examples of this. One was Kramer, um, where the real-life Kramer actually was somebody who lived across from Larry David for like six years, would eat things out of his fridge. I mean, Larry David seem to have been inspired by him. Now, Kramer never, the real-life Kramer never actually sued, although he did give a list of demands to the production studio. Uh, Castle Rock at one point was trying to make demands. He did, of course, capitalize on his newfound fame. And in fact, you know, a lot of what Kramer in the TV show then did was based on the real-life Kramer, like the reality tours and things like that. They kind of, the real-life Kramer continued to inspire the fictional Kramer, even as the show was going on. Um, 
the person who actually did sue was a real life Costanza, but um, his claims, so again, in part, he was bringing claims for false light and invasion of privacy, which you couldn't do in New York. Um, and so he actually, not only did his claims get dismissed, the court actually imposed a small sanction against him and his lawyer, like I think it was $2,500 each that they had to pay to Larry David um, and the other producers that he sued, which that had to hurt. So, um, so those were, so that's an example of an unsuccessful lawsuit. Going back to one of the early, early classics, uh, one of the most famous depictions of a real-life character in a movie is, of course, Citizen Kane, which is based on William Randolph, William Randolph Hearst. Um, and it was pretty obvious that it was Hearst, and Hearst was very mad, of course, that Orson Welles was doing this to him and tried to, he didn't bother with the legal system. Hearst was like, I have enough money and power. Um, he actually just basically tried to shut down the entire movie. He tried to threaten the, the distribution chains. He tried to threaten um, the producers. He tried to badmouth Wells. Uh, and, you know, there were those who were behind him and trying to shut this down. And in fact, Citizen Kane was very poorly received when it first came out, both critically and at the box office, um, in part because Hearst had hurt him in Hollywood. So, uh, but he did not sue. But that would certainly be another one of the most famous examples of a real life person depicted. Um, and in fact, though, I had to say, I think what I read is that Hearst was actually more upset about the depiction of, I think in the movie it's his wife, but it's based on his mistress, the comedic actress Marion Davies. He was upset by the way she was depicted in the movie. So, so those are some very famous examples of uh, shows drawing inspiration from real life. Which art often does. Yes, it does, and I think the courts realize that, that art imitates life, that we draw inspiration from life. I mean, and I have to say, too, there was one case, there was a, some a couple brought a lawsuit against the writers and producers of CSI, um, and in that case, it's because, like, the original early drafts that have been sent out actually used their names, you know, were based on their professions, all kinds of things. For the actual show, they did change the names, and I think a few other details, but the court even saying, it doesn't matter, even if you use the same name like Costanza or Kramer, that's not enough to get um, to show that you are actually the person. Like they basically said it had to get down to you need to be identified by a specific birthmark or maybe your birthplace or specific hairdo. Like you can't just say, you know, Josh Gilliland, a lawyer in California. That would they'd be like, we don't know it's that Josh Gilliland who's a lawyer in California. Like maybe if they're talking about the bow ties, maybe then Josh, you might have a shot. But the court says you have to be really painfully specific before they're willing to find that um, art is actually imitating life such that you could sue for defamation or something else. Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> well, this brings us to the $64,000 question. Who is your favorite stand-up comedian? Oh, and that is always so hard. And of course, you also always go back to the obvious ones, you know, I mean, I wish I could say, and I do, I love a lot of comedians, um, you know, who do a lot of different things. John Heffron has some brilliant bits. Kathleen Madigan is just always funny, but it is hard to top Chris Rock. And I guess I'm too young to appreciate the genius of Richard Pryor. Like, I like his stand-up. I get that he was funny. I've enjoyed it, but... I don't know, I guess having come up in a post-Richard Pryor world, I can't appreciate how brilliant it was. So to me, Chris Rock, at the end of the day, is still the most absolutely brilliant um, stand-up comedian there. And that's even saying, and I love Louis C.K. too, and I would say Louis C.K. is like just barely below him, but it is hard to top Chris Rock. How about you? Do you like anyone in particular? Well, my family used to own a comedy club. Which Really? And so, Rooster Teeth Feathers Comedy Club in Sunnydale, <laughs> California. Uh, are we still plugging this club? <laughs> yes, we are. Um, still friends with the owner. She okay. Very well, when I launched my iPad app, we actually had the launch party there. Oh, cool. Because it, you know, I spent a lot of time there in my early years of college, and we owned it throughout my entire collegiate and law school time. Oh, that would be awesome. So comedy is best enjoyed live. The cable channels that do specials, they are entertaining, and it's nice to be able to watch from the comfort of your own home mm -hmm. in your smoking jacket and have your pipe and, and <laughs> have, uh, you know, handy. However, it's best enjoyed live where you can get a beverage of your choice, 
you're that helps. Your, you're with your friends. And during the roosters years, the guys I really liked who were, who were still out there, Alonzo Bowden was a great guy, a lot of fun. Chicago Steve Barkley was a rip-roaring good time. Carlos Ars Rocky, who was in Reno 911 in Plains, uh, coming out you know, this year, great guy. And Dana Gould was a lot of fun, too. They, I mean, the list goes on with guys that I really liked and always enjoyed it when they came to the club because they were fun. You know? Yeah. And they took the time to write comedy. It's very easy to go for the lowest denominator type humor and then call that comedy. And, you know, I've, I've never liked that. I like the guys who think, who really put their knowledge and analytical skills to work because being a comedian is hard. It is. A lot of them clearly have anger issues. Um, I'd say one of them, you know, as everyone who watches this or reads our post know, um, know that I love Howard Stern. And one of the things I love about Stern is that he actually interviews a lot of comedians and is a big supporter of a lot of these comedians. Mm -hmm. And he actually just recently had in both Jerry Seinfeld and Kathy Griffin and was talking to both of them about how they work. And the thing about both of them, and I think this is true of most comedians, certainly successful ones, is that you have to live and breathe comedy. I mean, mm -hmm. they both said, every minute of their lives, be it with, you know, their best friends, their families, anyone, they are saying, can I make a bit out of this? I mean, and Jerry said that, and he thinks, I mean, he was saying that his purpose in life isn't to enjoy life, but it's to have others enjoy their lives and his show kind of thing. But it is amazing how these comedians, and you do have to be very intelligent, I think, to be a good comedian. Um, and so, yeah, how they are just constantly thinking about their craft and then getting up there and facing just brutal rejection night after night. I mean, that's it. They're very brave too. That's a very scary thing. Yeah. And it is not an easy job. You have to be sure of your self-esteem and all the good ones are very intelligent. Yeah. I've seen a bunch. They were, they were very good people. I always enjoyed talking with them after the show or getting to hang out with them. And there, there were tons of them who are just neat, neat yeah. people, fun to talk to. And, you know, that was a very good, you know, part of my life and being able to, to experience that. Yeah. And there's a bunch of them are still out on the road working the circuit, and God bless them, and I, I hope they are you know, have continued success. Well, cool. Well, good. Well, how neat. I am very envious of your time at the uh, comedy club. That would have been very cool. Remember, Maybe I should do that. Maybe that will be my next job. I want to run a comedy club. God bless you. Uh, <laughs> I can give you some people to talk to. But All right. Once the kids are older and aren't waking up at god awful hours. That's the only thing. I could not keep a comedian's hours. Those late nights. I can't do that. Never mind. Career plan over. Adjusted again. Back to being a lawyer. Damn it. Good call. Good call. <laughs> it is a hard <laughs> life, and they work so hard to make it happen. They so, do. So with that, America, stay geeky. And remember, visit live comedy at Comedy Near You, like Rooster Tea Feathers, which is not, unfortunately, sponsoring anything. <laughs> All right, and stay cool, Josh. I'm too freaking hot here in Wisconsin. Stay geeky, America. Stay geeky. <laughs>